Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Marple by various authors. 12 new stories, 12 great writers, one Agatha Christie. Um, so this is a new collection of Miss Marple short stories authorised by the Agatha Christie estate with a bunch of well-known authors in. Uh, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... Whoever you are, wherever you live, we all have our own village, and Miss Marple knows only too well what wickedness can lie under the most innocuous surface. Reacquaint yourself with one of Christie's finest creations as 12 of the world's best writers weave brand new stories that take you from St Mary Mead to New York, the South Downs to Hong Kong, the Italian Riviera to Cape Cod. Naomi Alderman, Lee Bardugo, Alyssa Cole, Lucy Foley, Ellie Griffiths, Natalie Haynes, Jean Kwok, Val McDermott, Karen M. McManus, Dreda Say Mitchell, Kate Moss and Ruth Ware. So, we're going to go ahead and get started with Evil in Small Places by Lucy Foley. Uh, tab number one. So we get a reference to Gluvine, yes that was it. Delicious, perhaps a touch too much cinnamon. Uh, so a, a foreign thing, it's it's just mulled wine, it's just the German word for mulled wine. But I suppose they wouldn't be that familiar with it at, at the time that these are uh, set. And we get a reference to, someone really has set the cat amongst the pigeons, which is cool because that's a, the title of an Agatha Christie novel. And Miss Marple says, words are words but they can be so dangerous, so misleading. And then we get this. Miss Marple let out the breath she had not realised she had been holding. And after that it became very difficult for me to take this entire collection of stories seriously because once you get that cliche, you know. We have The Second Murder at the Vicarage by Val McDermott. Obviously it's inspired by Murder at the Vicarage and acts kind of like a sequel slash follow up. And someone goes, that's odd don't you think, to enter a bookshop and come out empty handed. Uh, and that does play an important uh, plot point. But it depends, doesn't it? Because, I mean, I go into bookshops and look at what they've got there and then don't buy them and come home and buy them online where it's cheaper. We have Miss Marple Takes Manhattan by Alyssa Cole, in which Miss Marple goes to the Big Apple. That was actually quite a fun one. Uh, we get a reference to a hotel not being Bertram's, uh, you know, Miss Bertram's Hotel. Then we have The Unraveling by Natalie Haynes. Didn't tab anything out in that. Moving on to Miss Marple's Christmas by Ruth Ware. That is kind of quite Agatha because she did write a fair few books that took place at Christmas, like The Adventure of the Christmas Pudding and all of that. And uh, in that we get a reference to the Dashwoods. Um, and the Dashwoods were a well-known family in my local area, although I suppose it was probably a fairly well-known and well, you know, common surname. And we've got Sir Henry Clithering, and he goes, I rather like the old traditions. When I was a boy, the tradition in our village was to break off a berry every time one kissed a girl. And when all the berries were gone, so were all the kisses. What do you think, Miss Marple, shall we? And so they do. And Miss Marple goes, not my first kiss beneath the mistletoe, Sir Henry. It always reminds me of hat pins, you know. Hat pins, said Sir Henry, rather bewildered. I'm afraid you've lost me with the assertion there, Miss Marple. Oh yes indeed, young men used to loiter beneath it at Christmas parties and if a girl came past that they liked they would claim a kiss and sometimes they were rather insistent but my dear mother always used to advise all the young ladies to keep a hat pin in one's bodice there's nothing like a hat pin to provide a little discouragement to an unwanted suitor railway carriages too railway carriages oh yes, put in Mrs Bantry from her seat at the other side of the room I remember that quite well the train would go into a tunnel and all the knights would go out and the young men would seize the chance to kiss the girl sitting opposite them, complete strangers sometimes. And if it was a long tunnel of course, they would sit down before the train exited and then when the lights came on, you would be glaring at a row of young men quite unable to tell which of them it had been. But if you kept a hat pin to hand, you could jab them with it and that soon sent them scurrying back to their scene. Dear me, Dolly, said her husband, looking quite astonished. I had no idea you were so very fierce. Well, Arthur, only if one didn't like the young man. Alright, then we have The Open Mind by Naomi Alderman, didn't have anything out there. The Jade Empress by Jean Kwok, again, didn't have anything. Competent stories, just nothing really for me to share. Then we have A Deadly Wedding Day by Dredda Say Mitchell. And we get Marie goes, oh, she told me she was a friend of Tante Bella's. She used the French for aunt, emphasising the long E sound at the end. And I thought this was cool, it gives you a sort of sense of the timing of this, but also I'm a big Beatles fan so it's nice to see them represented even in this, this context. Uh, Bishop Ambrose, please forgive the interruption, but I just thought I'd take this opportunity to say how much I enjoyed your talk warning good Christian folk about the dangers of listening to those young men from Liverpool. The Beatles, is it? Ambrose was flattered enough to forgive her mistake. It was the Rolling Stones, madam, but thank you. All right, then we have Murder at the Villa Rosa by Ellie Griffiths. Someone int introduces themselves, they go, Felix Jeffries. The writer, said Lady Braithwaite. Yes, I said, feeling embarrassed as I always do when I admit to spending my days in this way. And then Colonel Peter says, luck is only another word for cunning. Great little bit of one-two here. 
That reminds me of someone in my village, said Miss Marple, rather to my surprise. Mrs. Randall disposed of her husband because every night, at ten o'clock precisely, he always said, I'm going up the wooden hill to Bedfordshire. I can see how that would get on your nerves, I said, but divorce seems an extreme reaction. Oh, she didn't divorce him, said Miss Marple. She killed him. Nice little bit of uh, reflection here. It kind of gets a bit meta, but it's also interesting to me as a crime writer. Endings are vital for a crime writer. You have to solve the crime, identify the culprit, dispense justice and tie up any loose ends, all in the last 50 pages. Any sooner and readers will complain it's too easy. Any later and they will feel shortchanged. Let me get this. It, it sometimes seems as if all the world is writing a book, I said. I always feel that it must be a very hard thing to do, said Miss Marple. Much more difficult than it seems. All right, on to the murdering sort by Karen M. McManus. And this annoyed me because it was written in the present tense, which is apparently what Karen M. McManus does. Um, but it just, I don't like the way that it reads. So on to the mystery of the acid soil by Kate Moss. We get another reference to Bertrand's Hotel, which I thought was cool. We get this, uh, again, another little one to her, which I enjoy. I've never been an advocate of teetotalism, said Miss Marple primly. A little strong drink is always advisable on the premises in case there is a shock or an accident. Have we had a shock or an accident? No, she twinkled. But travel is wearying, is it not? And we learn that people put, uh, use razor blades around the roots of plants like rhododendrons and the like to acidify the soil. And somebody died because they cut their finger on a rusting blade. And Emmeline goes, uh, things never seem to change for the better. Oh, I don't believe that's true, countered Miss Marple. Think of the extraordinary advances in healthcare, many of them, so I'm told, the result of research carried out during the two world wars. There is always good in bad, as there must always be bad in good. Let me get this. Jane Marple had not been aware she was holding her breath, but now she exhaled. What is with this? It's a horrible cliche anyway. But also, they keep trying to paint, paint Miss Marple as, like, not having lost her marbles. She's still very sharp, even though she's an old lady. And yet she keeps forgetting to breathe. Uh, then we have The Disappearance by Lee Bardugo. And Miss Marple has the great line, No woman who has been married that long smiles at her husband so much. It isn't natural. And that is all I got for you. So yes, uh, Marple by various authors. I wasn't expecting it to be particularly good and it was still kind of a letdown. I guess the issue for me, those cliches just really wound me up. Uh, that entire story written in present tense also wound me up. I just don't think it did Miss Marple justice. I think it was always going to struggle, but I, I don't think it even got close to the mark. There are one or two, like Val McDermott's story was really good. Um, Dread to Say Mitchell's story was pretty good as well. I even liked Ruth Ware's. Um, so some of them were good, but some of them not so much. Um, I worry that people are going to pick this up and they're going to think that's what Miss Marple is like and then they're not going to pick up the original Miss Marple books, which would be a shame. Overall, I gave it a 3.5 out of 5, but I feel like that's a generous rating. Um, I would only recommend it if you've already read all of the Miss Marple books, otherwise probably don't bother. So there we have it, that's what I made of Marple by various authors. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.